Paul's letter to the Romans, it's one of the longest and most significant things ever written by the man who was formerly known as Saul of Tarsus. He was a Jewish rabbi belonging to a group known as the Pharisees, and he was passionate and devout to the Torah of Moses and the traditions of Israel. And he saw Jesus and his followers as a threat. But then he had a radical encounter with the risen Jesus, who commissioned him as an apostle, like an official representative, to the world of non-Jewish people called Gentiles in the Bible. And so he started going by his Roman name, Paul, and he traveled all around the ancient Roman Empire, telling people about the risen King Jesus, and forming his followers then into these new communities called churches. And Paul would occasionally write letters to these new Jesus communities to help them foster their faith or answer questions. And the book of Romans is one of these. It was actually written quite late in his career. Now we know from the book of Acts that the church in Rome had existed for some time, that it was made up of Jewish and non-Jewish followers of Jesus. But at one point, the Roman emperor Claudius had expelled all of the Jewish people from Rome. And then about five years later, all of those Jews, including Jesus following Jews, were allowed to return. And when they did, they found a church that had become very non-Jewish in custom and practice. And so this created lots of tension. So that by Paul's day, the Roman church was divided. People disagreed about how to follow Jesus. They were debating about whether non-Jewish Christians should celebrate the Sabbath or eat kosher or be circumcised. And so Paul wrote this letter to accomplish a few things. He wanted this divided church to become unified and for a practical purpose. He was hoping that the Roman church could become a staging ground for his mission to go even further west all the way to Spain. And so these circumstances are what motivated Paul to write out his fullest explanation of the gospel, the good news that he was announcing about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Well, I'm excited to start a, a nine-week series this weekend. Um, which, so we're going to be in this for a little bit. We're calling it to the Church of Converge. And the reason we're calling it to the Church of Converge is because Paul wrote a bunch of letters to churches early on in the New Testament church. Paul had churches that he would influence, and he would write to them because of issues they faced. In this case, divisions. Maybe it was some things, some bins. They, they were building on the wrong things. Maybe they let some stuff creep into the church. And Paul wrote nine letters to churches. Churches in, the, in Ephesus, Galatia, Philippi, Thessalonica, Colossae, Philippi, and um, Ephesus. I think I hit all of them. He wrote a couple letters to Thessalonica and a couple letters to Corinthians, to the church in Corinth. And so I want to look, and, and we want to look at this series and say, what would Paul be saying to us? Like, if we were to try, and this is way more harder than when Ed and I were talking about this. This was a hard week for me because we're taking a whole letter and trying to draw like a main theme, a main idea. And every week we're going to take that main idea, that sentence that is sort of at the heart of what Paul is trying to say, and we're going to write a letter to us. So as Paul's talking to these churches, there's things that we can learn. And so we're starting this weekend's message. Paul's writing a letter to us as converged. So this is a series that will be applicable and hopefully relevant to us as individuals, but but it's about us as a church. Who, who is God calling us to be? And that's where we we start today. You saw in the video that, that Paul writes this letter to a church that is divided. You know, there's a, there's a new way of doing things and the old way of doing things, and this church is, is, is divided. Like the Jews, have, have they, they've decided that it's okay for the Gentiles to be in on this God thing, in on this Jesus thing, as long as they do it the way that they do it. And, and so there's this tension and and Paul writes, and he's trying to say to these new Gentile believers that have never been invited into the story of God, here's the, the line in our letter. So our letter is going to grow by a sentence every week. And this week, and here's how the letter starts. To the church of Converge, you be who God calls you to be. Do we have that? To the church of Converge, you be who God calls you you to be. Oh, it's right there. I was like, oh, my goodness. You be who God <laughs> calls you to be. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just, uh, the wind got to me, guys. It's just the wind. It messed with me. My equilibrium's off. That's what it is. Uh, but I would even, I might even emphasize that I, I, I could see us saying, you be who God calls you to be. You know what I mean? Because it's so easy for us to tell other people who they should be. Or we look at another church or we don't go to that church anymore because they do this thing. And we have a tendency to know all the things we, we think church that aren't doing it right should be doing. But we miss the digging in to really discover who has God called us to be. And so I believe that 
Paul is writing to this new church that is a, kind of a, a mixture of Gentiles and Jews that are trying to coexist, and there's some tension. And, and Paul, in essence, writes to the Gentiles that you be who God's called you to be. He's called the Jews to do things, and he's called them to, the, the, the Torah really matters to them, but you be who God has called you to be. I want to see if we can start together in Romans chapter 1. I'm going to be, a lot of these verses that I'll do today won't be on the screen. Um, so if you want a Bible, just a reminder, they're in the back. The version I'll be reading from is in the back. So you're welcome to slip away and get some. Or you can even like wave your hand. I see Jason back there. He'll be happy to bring you one. But let me start. This will be on the screen. Romans chapter 1. I want to read the first seven verses together. This letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. I just want to start. I want to hit a point. You can keep that up there. I want to just pause because this is profound to me. As I watched that video, the, the narrator referenced it, but, but Paul is saying, this letter is from Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, chosen by God to be an apostle to, to, and sent out to preach his good news. But did you know that, that Paul used to be Saul, as church kids know that, and for a vocation, Saul's nine to five, somebody has to know, what was Paul's nine to five, Saul's nine to five before he became Paul? Yeah, he's the persecutor of Christians. He, he was the guy who would be find out who is this, what's this Jesus movement doing? And he would find these, these new believers, these new Christians, and he would persecute and torture and even and kill them. And then, and then God meets him in the middle of where he's at on his way to do that. And he is radically changed, so much so that Saul adopted his Roman name of Paul so that he could be an advocate for and relevant to the, 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 those that he wanted to reach that he stood against just, just shortly before. I heard a preacher say, this, this isn't my message. He said, this is like the chips and salsa before the message. Like, I don't want to fill up on it. I don't want to fill up my time with this. But I just wanted to say to you today, as I was reminded, I have a tendency to want to run away from my past, maybe pretend as if it didn't exist and put that in our rearview mirror. But I see in the life of Paul that God was God even before Saul knew that God was God. God was faithful and writing a story in Saul's life before Saul. In fact, Saul would probably say with his new calling to reach the people that he once killed, it's safe to imagine that Saul, now Paul, had a lot of regrets. I wonder if he regretted. I wonder if he saw people now that he's trying to minister to and that, that, that dad that he's trying to minister to now remembers when he came into his house and, and yanked his wife and kids out into the street. And So Saul's probably riddled with regrets. But what Saul turned Paul realized is that God was at work even before he knew that God was working. And so rather than run away from the past, the prayer, the chips and salsa type prayer is, God, I trust you to redeem my past. I don't have to hide from it. You're going to be faithful to do something brand new because you can make broken things new again. If there's anybody in this room that's, that knows that they have a, a friend in Jesus that can restore and redeem a past, somebody say amen. amen. I, know, I, I know I know that. So, so keep reading in, in verse 3. The good news is about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line, and he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the, the, raised from the dead by the power of of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And just to hit pause, keep that up there. So Paul is in essence saying now, there's quarrels among you, there's division among you, but Paul is starting this letter to Romans saying, there's, there's a main thing that you need to build on. And in the second that you make the main thing not the main thing, then you're, do, you're building the wrong thing. And so Paul needed to make sure that they, the, the church in Rome knew that Jesus has got to be central. And when you make anything other than Jesus central, like the way we worship and the places we worship and the, the practices that we do and the food that we eat, Paul's starting the letter by saying, I need us to be building on the main thing. We have to discover what is the point of all of this. And, and Paul is, is allowing the church to know that Jesus is the main thing. I would say to us, converge hopefully you know this but make no mistake about it we are a jesus church we are about what jesus has done we are about the work that jesus wants to do in every single life that comes into these doors or that we get to meet outside of these doors we are a jesus church and we have to be about building on that uh, verse five through christ now that paul says now that i told you what the point is it's through christ that god has given us the privilege and the authority 
uh, as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. In verse, in verse 6, it says, and what are those next three words? You are included. I, man, I tell you what, I, I never, I've read this verse a bunch, but I, I missed until this weekend what that would have meant to the Gentiles. Because every time a pillar of fire led people, and every time there was writing on the wall, every time Moses would come down from the mountain, every time a prophet of, of God would say, the Lord is saying this, here's the heart of God, the Gentiles were excluded from any of that. They were always on the outside of ever being able to know God. And Paul now is saying, I just want you to know you are included. You just, you just got to take a moment to know what a big deal that was. And I, I want to say this, 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 I guess, is like the, it's a very carb-tastic message. This is the bread and butter before the meal. And now, so we had our chips and salsa. Now I'm going to give a little bit, one more, one more quick appetizer. I just want to say, and I'm hoping, that if you're here and you've been around this community for a while, this is going to be an amazing place to amen. Uh, and that's this, that everybody who comes in here, we need to be a church that is about reminding people that they can belong here with us. That, that, well, that was like, it was, I pre it, was like it was like a golf clap style amen. I wanna, and, and, I, and the reason this is important is because I know for a fact, I had conversations even Friday night that there are people, I had a conversation this morning and somebody said, I'm trying to reach this guy, but they're just convinced that, that when they come in the room, they're going to just combust in flames because they're that unholy. And, and we hear that and we chuckle about it. So you got to know my heart for us is that everybody that comes, so just like Paul said to the church in Rome, I'm saying to you, the message that we have to constantly be saying is that there are those out there there that think they don't belong in here with us. And so we need for everybody that comes in here. In fact, this might be for you today, joining us for the first time or the first time in a long time. And I need you to know that here you are included. Somebody say amen. amen. That's the church that we want to be. Paul says you are included among those Gentiles who have been called to belong to Christ Jesus. Verse 7, I am writing to all of you. Now, now Paul sort of pivots a little bit. Now he's writing to the Jews and the Gentiles that are all here in Rome trying to do church together. You who are loved by God and are called to be his own holy people. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you two important ingredients if you're trying to build unity, grace and peace. Listen, unity will never, ever happen without those two things. You know, I, I think in some ways, if there's a lack of unity, we could probably safely assume we're missing grace and peace because those, the, the, the byproducts of, of, of not having grace and not choosing to live in peace is a whole lot of hurt feelings and a whole lot of baggage and a whole lot of broken hearts. And so Paul is saying, before I get any further into this, for us to build unity, we got to all agree. We got to show each other grace and we got to live in peace. And, and so I, I, boiled, I boiled down the message into a sentence. Um, that doesn't mean you're getting off the hook to where then you get to leave right after the sentence. But, but I wanted to boil it down to a sentence because it helped me say, okay, if you could leave here and you could know one thing, you get a text message and you got to slip away, um, this would be what I would want to make sure everybody that is here with us today understands. And it's this. Uh, this is kind of what I was musing and I put it together in a sentence that what Paul is trying to say in the book of Romans is that the they and the them had to become the we. The they and the them had to learn to become the we. Because what happened is that you got the Jews that are what they're doing and the Gentiles have always been excluded from that. They really weren't supposed to really coexist. That was how it all worked. And you got the Gentiles that, that already feel like outsiders. Paul's trying to let them know that they're included, but, but they're never going to be good enough to sit at the table with these good, good Jewish people. And so what Paul is saying is what has to happen as we move forward here in order to affect Rome with the gospel of Jesus Christ is that the they and the they them have to learn to become the we. I think this is relevant for us. In fact, I think it's like specifically relevant for us because there is a natural built in, no one meant to do it. It wasn't intentional. But there's a natural kind of built in they and, and them in our storyline. If, if a buddy of mine was thinking about launching a church, I would say to him or her, 
Short of God telling you that it's unmistakable voice of the Lord says to do it this way, I would not recommend trying to launch a brand new work out of an existing work because it is very hard to untangle. There are folks that are so loving the old that when you introduce new, they feel like their system and their what they love is, 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 that, is, being, is being attacked. And so we had this thing where there's folks that though we've only been to church since October, we've We've been a church for a little over three months, but I've been worshiping with some of the people in this room for nine years. And so in, in our context, we have to learn what is the we that God is calling us to be? How do we become a God-honoring church that no longer just cares about where we've been, but we anchor into the new thing, understanding where we are going? And it's kind of similar to what Paul was writing here. I wrote this down. It wasn't about the old becoming more like the new, or the new doing things that the old were accustomed to doing. That's where the conflict and unrest and even diminished sense of belonging comes from. It's about being who God's called us to be, not trying to be who we used to be doing the things that we used to do. And when I, when I wrote that, it, it creates a diminished sense of belonging. The second that you have a, a they and a them reality, instantly you're, there's a diminished sense of belonging because there's people on the other side of the room that you don't feel like you can belong with. But when we have a sense of we, then everyone gets to belong. So who are we? Paul saying to us, to the church of converts, you be who God's called you to be. And so in order to keep me on track and sort of have a, a train of thought that I could sort of preach today, I decided to look at our vision statement. Our vision statements are to know Christ, to build community, and to engage culture. So I just really wanted to briefly look at these those three things because I believe that's who God's calling us to be. That's, that's sort of the, the, the 30,000 foot view that through the life of our church, we'll be learning how to execute. And so the, who is God calling us to be? Number one, we are called to know Christ. That's what God has called us to. We, it's on our website. It's all over any of the things that are telling people about who we are. We are about a church that wants to keep Christ at the center of everything we do. And I just wanted to tell you that Paul thought this was important as well. In fact, Paul, for the first seven chapters of Romans, is, is pretending as if no one knows who Christ is, and he's telling the story of Jesus, because what's the point of saying anything else if people don't have an understanding of Jesus? What's the point of building anything at all if people don't just know Christ? Because knowing Christ is the most important thing. So I, this weekend, I, I like highlighted does your Bible have those little subheadings? You know, it kind of tells what's what's going to be in the next passage. I went through and I highlighted every subheading, and it is the it is the most like this clear presentation of the gospel ever. Did you know who? How many of you guys would, would know what I mean when I when I talk about that little little leather band that had a, a, a red bead and a, a bead bead and a yellow bead and a white bead and a green bead? anybody anybody know it yet? Yeah, all of us good old church kids. Yeah, that's that was the Romans road of salvation on your band, and those colors were attached to a verse in Romans and. Uh, you've heard me mention the Romans road. That's how I learned about Jesus was studying the verses that are on the Romans road to salvation. With the Romans road to salvation, they're verses pulled from Paul's letter to Rome, simplifying the message of Christ to make sure everybody could understand it. And so I, I, for some of you, this is like, Dustin, we, we, we know Christ and we don't need to read this again. Well, I, I, I beg to differ because Paul was talking to a church full of Jews and Gentiles who had already trusted Jesus, but he just wanted to make sure he doesn't take a step into the new thing that God's doing without doing this. So I'll just hit the, a couple of the subheadings and read the verses. This is, this is Paul's, maybe Paul was wearing a, a, bead, a beaded bracelet of his own and, and he did these, these verses. So the, the, the next subheading is on uh, verse 8 just says God's good news. So, so Paul already hit the opening, which is greetings from Paul. And then my next subheading says God's good news. And I wanted to read verse 16 of chapter one. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. Paul is saying, this is an open invitation. And I'm saying to you, family, this is an open invitation. The next thing that the subheading that I have, it says God's anger at sin. And Paul's setting the stage 
You, you won't know the beauty of Christ until you know the consequence of sin. And sin is a chasm between us and God. And I, some people like to, I've heard it said that Dustin, you don't preach about sin enough. I'm, I do. I, I'll tell you all about sin, but I just, I want to preach more about Jesus who defeated the consequence and the, the penalty of sin. And so, but, but we have to understand that our sin creates disconnects and chasms between us and God. So in verse 18, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people. Verse 20, this has always been a perplexing verse for me. I wanted to read it. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities. And Paul's saying, when you look up, there's no way you cannot know that there is a creator that has made all of this thing. So then he ends that sentence with his eternal power and divine nature are there on display. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Our excuse to know God is removed because we look around and see the power of a creator in creation. I, I was thinking about this verse and reminded that we were wired with that like hardwired give God glory. That was how we were created. You know, just like the stars as they shine or giving God glory, the songs that the birds sing, those are, just, those are just worship songs that they'll sing till the day they die. They don't know how to stop singing. And the, as the wind is, of course, I wish the wind would stop giving God glory a little bit. Like, but as the wind blows, somehow it's giving God glory. And, and so then we, when we were created, we were wired that the things that we did the walking around was giving God glory because we were doing what we were made to do, just enjoying his creation. We were hard wired with that. But then, then a virus, I was thinking this week and I was thinking that then it's really like a, a virus that God wired us to, to be drawn towards him, that creation, all of creation is, is leaning into the creator and then sin into the world as a virus. And what's a virus do? A virus completely finds a way in through what seems like the original intent, but once there, it destroys. Once there, it steals. Once there, it completely does a mission and an agenda other than. And sin basically said to us, you know what? You deserve glory. Evan, you, you're, you deserve glory. Dustin, you deserve glory. Ed, you deserve glory. And sin makes it to where we now think we deserve glory. And then the next subheading is why it says that God's angry at sin. And then, but the, here's the beautiful thing. And I, you're probably, I'm okay. This is a review, a review, a review class. How many of y'all have re, renewed your vows before? Yeah, cool. Evan, this right here, when I'm done, I'm going to say a prayer and it's going to be a renewal of vows for some reminding Whew, Jesus, like you are so faithful. You are so good. And for others, it's going to be an invitation to begin to know Christ today. Here's what Christ did. In verse 21 of chapter 3, Christ took our punishment. Verse 23, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of sin. Aren't you glad that we are freed from the penalty of sin? Verse, verse 1 of chapter 5, my subheading says, now because of that, faith brings joy. Verse 1 of chapter 5 says, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because we know what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us because of our faith. And then it says, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. We confidently and joyfully look forward, look forward to sharing in God's glory. Paul's unpacking for this church the most important thing before I talk so much to the church of Rome. The most important thing is that you all know Christ. And then he, he ends right before I get to, to chapter 8, which is where the narrative changes a little bit. He ends at the, in chapter 7 right there at verse 14. My subheading says there's a, still a struggle with sin. And I, this, this, is, this is important that you know on the journey to knowing Christ, it's not a flip a switch and you don't struggle and you don't make mistakes. It says, Paul said this, Paul said, so the trouble is not with the law for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me for I am all too human. I'm a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself or I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I want to ask you to raise your hand, but and by relate to that, you know, I, I know I do. And, and Paul's saying the remedy for that is to constantly, I, I, I mentioned it last week, we're, we're in a new creation. It's to constantly be renewing this understanding of what Christ is because it's knowing Christ that helps us combat the, the reminders of our past and the regrets. And the, the, when the enemy says, you could never lead that group, you could never teach that class, you could never volunteer to serve if they found out that you. 
And I want to say to you today that when you know Christ, he redeems those things. And knowing Christ is the most important thing that we can be about before we try to be a church that accomplishes anything. Amen. So I, I, just, I just wondered if with every head bowed, it, it we'll do it the old school way, the way I, raised, I was raised in. I was, I, I've done a million altar calls in my life. I won't call anybody forward, but with every head bowed, I, I wonder if we could, don't even have to say it out loud, but I wonder if, if I gave space in between a prayer, if you, if you could in your, m- mumble it, all of us, that way no one feels like we're, they're out of place here. We could just, maybe it's a renewal of vows. Maybe it's been a long time since you've closed your eyes to pray. Maybe you came in here just, kind of not sure what you were going to discover, and you were going to stumble into knowing Christ today. I want to see if I can lead us through a prayer that maybe you would pray. Like I said, don't have to do it out loud. Just under your breath, you say, gracious God, thank you for Jesus. I know me. I'm a sinner. Sometimes I do what I hate. And it's hard to do what I want to do. But Christ saves me and redeems me. And all I have to do is say, I accept Christ. So I accept you. Thank you for the work of Christ. That though you have every right to be angry, your anger was poured out on Jesus. I could have never stood if you poured it out on me. So thank you for grace. Teach me what it means to know Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said Knowing Christ, the most important thing that we can be about as a church. What else are we called to? Number two, we're called to build community, to create connection, to live like a family. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 8. He begins at this point to do a lot more talking about how we live together. What's it mean now that we know Christ? And in in, in verse 15 of chapter 8, I'll have it on the screen. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. And now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit. We are now God's children, which through Jesus makes us all what? The family of God. Like you, even if you have to look across the aisle, look one way, and if it's, you got to say, hey, hello, big brother. Or the other way and say, hello, sis. Do, I want you to do it. Like look to the person to your left and right and say, hello, big brother. Hello, sis. Or, hello, little brother. And you know what the weirdest thing of that for me is when I realize that my wife is my sister before she's my wife. It's a weird thing to try to get your, your head around, but, but we are the family of God before we are anything else. What's that mean? That means that we're prone to dysfunction. Because I don't know anybody here and is like, actually, I've never had an ounce of dysfunction in my family. Well, then you are officially hired as the family pastor because I know that's not my story. We are the family of God, brothers and sisters. And so do you know how important it is to stay connected together? And let me just let you in on a little secret. Like, though this is a message for Converge, and I just want you to remember this and log it away that when you get angry at somebody in this room and you decide to change churches, you're no less brother and sister with that person. We are the family of God that stretches out across the entire city, no matter in the country, in the world, no matter what name is on the door. So you don't get to abandon family because you change churches. So why not stick together as a family and learn to figure it out? Because you never really stop being family. You don't divorce somebody in the family of God. You don't, you don't emancipate somebody in the family of God. We, through Jesus Christ, are the family of God. And when, we're in the hand, when we are in the hand of Christ, no one can pluck him out. We can't, we can't get plucked out of God's hand. And so we are the family of God. My sisters tell this story every time I see them. And, and I, don't, 
I know it's coming, and I go, guys, do we have to do this again? Like, there, I was, I'm the big brother, and when my parents would leave, uh, you, some of you guys are going to be like, well, that, 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 that explains a lot when I tell you this story. But my, my parents would leave, and I'd do this thing where I'd collect all the cushions on the, all, on the couches, and, uh, and I would, I would ha- make my sisters hold them like this. So they'd, so they'd have these big old cushions here. They were little. And, and um, uh, apparently with their story, this allegedly, <laughs> allegedly what would happen is that I would take a running jump and I would punch the pillows as hard as I could and they'd fall back into the couch. And I would laugh and they would say, Bubby, can we be done? And, and uh, so then I'd do it and then I'd, I'd drop kick them. And they tell me that story every time because they don't understand why that they let me do that. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know either. But I thought of that story as I was remembering that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. There will be things that we will do that just won't make sense. But that doesn't mean that we get to decide whether or not we want to remain brothers and sisters. And so why don't we learn to build community that goes the distance together? You know what? When Thanksgiving hit, I was not planning to go to Dayton, Ohio had no intention to go to Dayton, Ohio, but my family hit a hard time, and something tragic was happening in my family, so what did I do? My wife and I bought plane tickets that were, by the way, really expensive, and we went to Dayton, Ohio unexpectedly. Why? Because I don't talk to my family every day. I don't even talk to them often. When hard things hit, it's good to know you got family, and I would like for us to be a church that builds community, that builds connection, and and builds family. So we, we've put together, we've worked pretty hard to put together like what the new year is going to look like. And that's one of the reasons why I said I hope you'll be here today just to sort of unpack this uh, like face to face together. Um, just, just so that you know, not that you're look, looking for an excuse, but I'm really excited to begin to stick things on the calendar for what it looks like being a church as we enter 2023. Launching this thing and, and pulling this together and, and, and becoming a church and finding the the resources to do what we've done so far was pretty extensive work and a lot of pivoting, a lot of adjusting. And so our teams now, we had an elders meeting just last week and we're sitting with each other like so excited that number one, it's working and God's God's faithfulness is just on display and evident. And we are more financial healthy than I remember being since I've been uh, in this part of the country the last nine years. We are on a journey and a trajectory towards finally being a church that is healthy and sustainable. And I wanted to say to you that now that we are have those tools in place, I get to tell you about what it's going to look like and feel like to build community. I, I won't spend much time on it. Ed already hit it, but I didn't. Want, I wanted you not to forget this, this nexus thing, because it's more than just a, a, a small gr- a, a worship, I mean, a sermon series. This is where everything that we do, that is small groups, discipleship, uh, mentoring, all of that is going to hang in the umbrella that is known as nexus. I wanted to say specifically about small groups. We hit pause on small groups only only to do the work to build the strategies and an understanding for why do we even do small groups. There are folks in this room that have called me and said, I still want to do a small group. Can I do this, this, and this? And I said, no. No, I didn't say no. I said, of course you can. I said, in fact, your desire to do that is why we are launching this thing called Nexus. Because we, in my storyline, the church is responsible to put together these events and these programs and these things, and everyone just shows up. But Nexus is going to teach us that we have to be a church full of people that are trying to create community where they are, and the church comes alongside of you and resources you and helps you find ways to reach things and people in the way that matter to you. And so rather than say, here's the classes we're offering, just so that you know, we will be saying, here are the classes that we offer. But my hope is there are people in this room after they know who we are as a church and why it matters for you to build community. Because if I build community for our church, I reach this many people. If I lead people that want to build community in their communities, we reach this many people. And so doing small groups and And those things are going to be about resourcing you to say, I want you to reach your community. How can we help you do that? And so the Nexus journey is all about reshaping why we do those kinds of things. So make sure you'll be a part of that. So this one... 
We're re revitalizing, revamping, as we're calling this Get Out Adventures. This was something that was for the women's ministry, but now it's going to be for both. You don't know how many times like a Chris Gibson who like loves the mountain bike. He's always like, why are the women doing cool stuff? So at our church before this, um, at Impact, there was a ministry that was, that was for the women. It's called Get Out Adventures. And so uh, my, Melissa and I talked, and she's like, I want to do these kinds of things. And, 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 and just so that you know, if you say that I, want, I, I think we should do more of this, my first question is going to be, can you lead it? Uh, so, so she's she's we're working on a calendar together to do these adventures that are that are for it's co-ed now. And I kept the old name. I told Melissa, let's look for a new name. Um, and so she was open to that. And then I, I realized that. I like Get Out Adventures because I remember how many times that I'd be playing Mario Brothers for like the third hour or Tetris or Zelda. Um, I just dated myself really bad. But, um, and then my mom would say, Dustin, get outside and do something. And I would get outside and do something. And so we're going to create, if you enjoy getting outside, oh, there's going to be items on the calendar through the end of the year for you to do that so that we can do that together. I wanted you to know that. Uh, we also, uh, there's a couple of things, uh, there's calendar events I want to get to. So wait for that slide. I wanted to let you know we just launched something called Converge Takeout. I've mentioned it, but I wanted you to know why that we're doing it. Man, I wish I could preach the, the message, um, but I, I don't have time. Uh, the Converge Takeout is all about being a church that's, that's aware of the fact that COVID changed things. And we have a, a tendency as the church, because we would love for this room to be full, but there are people there, there are quite a few people. In fact, we wouldn't be able to uh, pay for the ministries we pay for if we diminish those that are, are watching and engaged virtually. And so we have decided and realized that what we've offered as a church has been like uh, these video cameras are videoing and we post that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. But it's hard for people to be thinking about church on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. And, and then even when they watch it, they get like they can look in the window from the outsiders looking in. And so we've decided that we're going to create a community, a virtual community. And so every week now, it's two weeks strong. Sunday morning at 9 a.m., we're creating a service that's just for those people that are watching virtually that aren't ready to come back here because we want everyone to be included. Now, for those of you that are here, if you are tempted to stay home, I'm going to be angry. I think, I, let me just say, I'll go on record saying, I don't, think anything I don't think anything can replace being the family of God together in a room. But there are a lot of people who discovered or rediscovered faith in a virtual setting, and I want them to know that we are still really anxious to get to know them and to meet them. There'll be people managing that, a specific person that's going to be in charge to get prayer requests and to answer questions. And so it's a way that we're going to build community outside of the walls of the church. Uh, and one of the things that has been hard for us is really knowing what's communication look like, especially when things are changing so, so quickly. Um, and not all of us are, read the newsletters. You know, some of us are guilty as charged with that. And so in order to strengthen our communication, which has been a weak point in my leadership, uh, being, being quick to communicate and knowing how, how, how constant of communication is necessary, uh, we're going to strengthen our communication by offering something that we're just going to simply call dessert with Dustin. So, so once a month on Sunday nights, we're going to offer a, a time where I'm going to bring desserts or something else that begins with a D, donuts or deli sandwiches, I don't know. And, and uh, we're going to have an hour, uh, if you ask anything, hey, I was wondering, what's our heart for this? I want to know more about the church. You, you can ask, when, when you preached on this and it's, it's, been, it's stuck with me, I wanted, to, I wanted to ask deeper. I mean, I just, if it's a personal conversation, my office is always open, but this is a chance for if you have a question, you're talking to somebody and they have a question, you can go, oh, hey, we, we'll have a chance in a week and a half to, to meet up and to ask those questions. And I, it's, it's a hope that we, we shorten the gap between you not knowing how quickly things are, are evolving and changing and hearing from someone who hurts from somebody else. And so I just wanted to say I, I, my heart is to keep you so in the loop. I don't know that we know how to do that effectively just yet as things change so quickly. So, so why not get together once a month and, and come and let's just talk, get to know each other. Um, my, there'll be sometimes that my wife will be there. And then it'll be uh, dessert and um, what would be a J word? And um, what? Dessert and juice with Justin, D Dustin and Jess. So, so we're going to start doing that. It's a hope to strengthen our communication. Here's our calendar of events. We're finally starting to put things together. So uh, next weekend, we're doing something called Laguna Village Takeover. 
Uh, that's where we are is Laguna Village. I hope you'll come planning to stay after and go to lunch at one of the restaurants here in Laguna Village. Go with someone you know or don't know uh, right after service. We're going to have to tear things down here, but uh, a lot of our team will be going to one of these restaurants as well. We just want our church that meets on Sunday morning to hang out for another hour and have lunch together and look across the restaurants and say, oh, this Converge people. And, and so we're going to do that next weekend. Can uh, Laguna Village take over? Uh, we'll go ahead and mark your calendar for the annual business meeting on February 26th. That's kind of our, our all church right now until we get our, our um, uh, get out adventures. Students, we're kind of, uh, some of you guys might have heard there's a transition that happened in stu uh, students. And so we are relaunching students. We've got a couple events on the calendar. Rock and Jump, January 12th. My wife and I are hosting a hangout at our house on the 18th. Mark your calendars for, for the 4th of March. Anybody heard of the place Serialism? Yeah, I hadn't either. Mag to Maggie said it's this it's this restaurant like it's what they have is like every cereal known to man, and uh, so we're gonna our, your, our families are gonna show up an old sack at Serialism from ten to noon on March fourth. Uh, mark your calendar for a uh, couple's outing for February. Uh, this will be available on the app. It, pro it might already be the app and the website. Why, did I, why am I telling Why did I spend the time on a Sunday morning telling you this? Because I, we, are, we are excited and anxious and committed to doing the kinds of things that build community outside of this room. And that takes time. And I didn't want for your sense of what's going on and what's happening next to, to detract from the reality that we are anxious to do these things and grateful for your patience and wanted to say to you, building community is what God called us to do and we're going to do that. Lastly and finally, very quickly, we are called to engage culture. Let me read you this verse. Justin, do you mind coming on up, brother? I can't say thank you. Can we honor Justin to tell him thank you for everything that he does, man? I can't say thank you enough, Justin, for your heart, man, and your faithfulness. It means the world. Uh, Romans chapter 10, I wanted to read this to you, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? How can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. Paul's talking to the church in Rome saying that what we're doing here is a great thing, uh, but there's people that aren't here yet, and we need to make sure that they know about what God is doing here with us. And so engaging culture is, is, is something that matters a lot to me in the DNA of our church. I wanted to tell you ways that we've done that um, so that you can celebrate that the way that, that I do. There's people that have visited um, our church because they came to the movies and they saw the sign that Maggie made that said, movies this week, try church next week. And there's people that have come to the movies with their families only to be engaged by a community of people that have open arms, right, where they typically show up. And which is pretty amazing to know that we are creating a church service where people are stumbling into the, a move of God because we're engaging them where they are versus waiting for them to come to what our address is, that, that to me sounds a lot like engaging culture with the message of the good news. This is, I, I might have mentioned this, I just wanted to say it again. One of the highlights of my year was my wife and I standing at the, in the mall for our Christmas concert. My wife and I standing at the door, and just behind us is Mr. and Mrs. Kloss. By the way, Vicki and Jean, thank you for doing that all the time. Yeah, let's thank them. <laughs> Greatest Mr. and Mrs. Kloss this side of the North Pole. Um, and, and so we, when we, had, we had all kinds of Christmas cookies, a hot chocolate bar, Mr. and Mrs. Claus, an incredible jazz band playing. You don't know how many times that a dad had a kid, and there's like four kids running to get to Mr. and Mrs. Claus. Mom's chasing them down, and the dad says, hey, how much is this? And Jess and I got to say, oh, no, this is for you. We just wanted to wish you a Merry Christmas and let you know that we're really thrilled to be able to be a part of your Christmas celebration. If you could see the look of confusion on their face every time, <laughs> like, okay, so you want my information. What do I got to do? No, this is just us being where you are, doing something to remind you that you matter and you can belong here with us. That's engaging culture. Uh, maybe some of you guys were here 
uh, or, or came Friday night to this thing that we did called Storytellers. I just wanted to let you know a couple of stories. I got the chance to pray uh, with several people to begin a, a journey of faith after that night of worship that we did at Old, Old Ironsides Friday night. Uh, one of the guys that were there, that was the very first event that he had gone to since getting released from prison. And uh, I got the chance to pray with him to receive Jesus on Friday night. My wife had a conversation with a lady that had struggled with alcoholism her entire life and had never really didn't want to come back into a, a bar. And so she said, I came here and I didn't drink. And this is a huge milestone for me because I came to the bar and instead of getting filled up with, with liquor, I got filled up with Jesus. Um, this is engaging culture. This is what we're called to do. And I wanted to make sure that you know and you celebrate that with me. Lastly, uh, me and Jonathan Small were talking about it just today. I love our church for this reason. Uh, we did a, a chili bowl at Waterman Brewing and, uh, and the, this is crazy. I'd never heard of this before. But the brewery said, hey, Jonathan, can you bring your church back every month? You guys were awesome. Uh, and w- that when the church gets invited anywhere, that's a, that's a work of God. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I thought that was pretty cool that we're going into places and people are going, you guys should come back. And, and this is what it means to engage culture. That's, that has to happen after the first two things. They're kind of chronological we got to be a church that knows who Christ is first and foremost, or else we will be about things that are not Christ-centered, and we don't want to do that. That's when it all goes sideways. After that, we got to build a strong community and sense of connection here. Um, that's going to have to happen next, or when we disperse, the odds of us coming back together get less and less and less. And so we got to know Christ. we got to be committed to each other as brothers and sisters, as the family of God, dysfunction and all sometimes. So it might feel like spiritually someone is stacking pillows in front of you and punching you in the gut. Well, you, you, you possess the ability to, years from now, be laughing about it because you got through it. And so I just want to invite us to be hard, work hard to be the family of God. And when we accomplish those two things, this city needs to brace themselves for what happens when we go out and tell the good news of what Jesus Christ is doing here in us and invite them to be here and be a part of it with us. My favorite moment of the Storyteller's Night, uh, the night of worship that we did, we try to do it every time. My wife came up kind of spontaneously. I asked her to help me sing a little bit. And, and uh, we sang, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. It always, like, chokes me up. You know, we're at Old Ironsides, one of the oldest bars in Sacramento. And, and uh, we are looking around a room as we're singing, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Because, you know, the difference maker will never be a great band or a good preacher or great programs. If we don't have the power of God that is given to us in his Holy Spirit, what we are doing is useless. But when we invite the Holy Spirit to be here, it is incredible what can happen, that every room we walk into can change when we pray this prayer. And we're a church without walls, so we're constantly going to be going in the different rooms. May this course, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. There's nothing I want more. May this course go ahead of us so the rooms that we walk into change the atmosphere of those rooms to the life-changing power of what Jesus wants to do. Can we stand together? Justin's going to sing this quickly, and we're going to go.